12 critical facts about sailing to New Zealand. Hello and welcome to the Sailing My Magic channel. My name is Duke and Magic is my 2015 Lagoon Catamaran that I am solo sailing around the world. First, do not stock up too heavily on food. New Zealand wants to protect the, their biosecurity. There have been many instances in the past where people have brought in, in invasive species. They do not want you to bring in seeds of any sort that might get lodged in their soil. They do not want pork products of any sort because there's been some disease in some of the local places with pork. They don't want eggs to come in, although they will make an exception for mayonnaise, which is mostly egg whites, if it was produced in the United States. There are going to be several pieces of paperwork that you need to do. The easiest way to get admission, and I believe that's the way they use on airplanes also, is the NZETA. That gives you admission into the country if you're in one of the countries that's allowed without a visa for 90 days out of a two-year period. You can go in and out several times. There's an application for that. You download the app. You submit the documents that you need. It's going to be things like a copy of your passport bio page. Um, on your boat, you need the registration for the boat. Um, proof of the value of the boat in case there's an insurance claim. Uh, your insurance. There's a extra need for third-party insurance for New Zealand. It's five million New Zealand dollars, which is about 3.1 US dollars currently. Your insurance company can help you with that. And they want a picture of your entire boat. The most common way to sail to New Zealand is from Tonga. And Tonga has many islands in the island chain. So you're going to be dodging a lot of islands and you have to be aware that the entire Tonga chain was a, a bunch of sunken volcanic calderas, which means there are low spots in there. Look at your charts very carefully so you can figure out how to get through without uh, hitting a low spot, in this case, a high spot. This trip will take you one to two weeks, probably, depending on the weather, of course. And that gives you an opportunity to do some repairs along the way. I've put a third reef in the head sail. I've got two reefs in the main, so I should be all set. But I ended up having three problems and had to work on them overnight, haven't slept yet. Uh, the first problem is, is one of the ratchet straps broke on the dinghy. The second problem is, is the furling line on the head sail. Uh, it was loose and it got caught underneath the uh, furling drum and locked in there real tight and wound over itself. So I had to climb out on the trampoline in the middle of the night uh, working on this thing. Got, got quite wet at the same time. I got two reefs in the mainsail too. However, one of the uh, carriages that guides the sail up the mast uh, broke. It became uh, wedged in with the um, flag line, of the line for hauling the flag up and down, which I had just recently replaced with parachute line, so it's very strong. And I don't know how or if I'm going to be able to get the sail down with it like that slowed me down a little bit that way, which is what I wanted, so I don't get there too soon. But uh, I'm going to have to work on that. I should hit a doldrum somewhere along this trip, and when I do, that's going to be the time to try and take the sail down and straighten that out. Okay, I made progress. Previously, the flag line was twisted and tangled around the end of the batten on the mainsail. Uh, I was able to get the batten free. Number six is the weather. The weather has been highly variable lately and looks like it will continue to be so. That's going to affect your routing and looking for a weather window. Do not count on any of the weather um, recommendations in any of the books or anything. 
look at your current weather reports and look for updates as often as possible. Number seven, let's talk about radios. Now, if you're coming from the U.S., you're used to using the U.S. bands, uh, which is fine for much of the world in the Bahamas and things like that. But out here, they use the international bands. You have to switch your radio over to the international bands. You can still get 16 on international and uh, American, but a lot of the others, the bands don't line up with the uh, channels that they're using. You need to decide on a food plan ahead of time. The products that are most likely to get confiscated in New Zealand should be the ones that you eat first. Most canned goods are okay. That's probably not going to get confiscated unless it's something like uh, cock bin with bones in it. But uh, ordinary canned goods, they're probably not going to take. Pork, for instance, bacon or eggs, you're going to, going to want to have eaten all those by the time you get to New Zealand. Because the weather changes so much during the route there, if you leave for, from Babau in Tonga to go directly to New Zealand, it's 1,200 miles. There are some closer places and you might want to stop at uh, Minerva Reef. I didn't stop there for several different reasons, but that's just my choice. But because of that distance, you're going to want to be able to change your route along the way. For instance, the wind changed direction uh, when I was going southwest. And since that's the direction I want to go, I've got to tack back and forth to get below that spot. And there's going to be a dead zone in between that I need to get past, so I'll probably motor through that. But be prepared to change. During COVID, they reduced it down to one or two spots in New Zealand that you could check in. Now they've opened up a bunch of places, so there's a, a list. Uh, Opua is still open and one of the primary spots because it's one of the farthest out on the coast. Bangarei, which is spelled with a W-H, uh, that's a good spot. There, there are many others opening now, so check the list for the latest ones when you go down there. If you're going down to wait out the cyclone season, which is what many people do going to New Zealand, you're going to be there for six months. In that case, the NZ ETA is not going to be enough. You're going to need to get a six month visa. Um, I suggest you get there on the NZ ETA, wait a month, and then apply for the regular long-term visa, the six month visa. And that will give you a little wiggle room in case the cyclone season lasts a little longer than expected. Now a lot of people think that they're going to rent a car and drive around New Zealand, which you can, and it's obvious that for six months you're going to have many places to visit. But what most people do is end up buying a cheap car. They're, they're very inexpensive there if you get a, just an economy car. And you can resell it and get all or most of your money back. But there are some caveats. Uh, number one, the car has to be inspected to see that it's safe and stuff before it can be sold to you. But when you go to sell it, it's also got to be inspected. Now, not all places inspect them as well as others. It's best if you find out exactly where your car was inspected when you bought it and take it back to the same place when you sell it. That way you're not going to have a inspection company at the end that says 20 things are wrong with your car that you need to pay to fix in order to sell it. Also be aware that there are some issues with car theft. You might want to put one of those um, red metal bars that hooks around the steering wheel and the gas pedal. Please click on like and subscribe if you haven't already. It helps and it's totally free. And now let's get ready for the sailor's tradition, the sundowner. Have a great time.